Hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, according to wherever in the world you might be. I hope you're all doing well today. Um, all right. As you know, uh, we like to start things off and just dive right in. Before we get started, I do have an announcement to make. Uh, yesterday, the dates for Ramadan were announced, and our April webinar was scheduled for the 24th, which falls during the Eid period, so um, so that our members and other people who just join us for our webinars can uh, have their family time for the Eid festivities. We are rescheduling that. It will take place on the 3rd of May instead, and it will be at the same time, which was uh, 12 o'clock GMT or 1 p.m. Uh, British summer time. Okay, and with that, I will go ahead and jump into a quick uh, introduction to the ICCP, uh, who we are and what we do. Okay, so who is the ICCP? What are we? What do we do? Um, the Institute of Construction Claims Practitioners is a professional members organization that recognizes the skills and uh, knowledge it takes to professionally manage claims. We have three main objectives, which are to establish international professional standards, to give recognition for those who have gained that knowledge, and also to help and educate those who would like to gain the knowledge and skills to prepare and manage claims to the best, highest standards. And why is there the need for the ICCP when there are so many professional organizations for people in the construction industry? Well, quite simply, claims have become a key part of the industry uh, internationally. And claims practitioners come from a broad variety of backgrounds, from engineering, quantity surveying, uh, legal, project management, it is a broad spectrum, and so there are organizations that cater to each of those individually. But until the ICCP, there has been no institute established just to recognize those who have the specialist knowledge, experience, and skills to manage, prepare, and respond to claims to the highest level of professionalism. Okay, so I will quickly introduce our steering committee. Um, uh, Andy Hewitt, our executive officer, who will be presenting today's webinar. We also have an elected president and three elected fellows. Nina is the general manager. She is currently on maternity leave and I am in her place at the moment. Okay, and in terms of membership, we have three levels of regular individual membership, each of which have their own criteria. We also have student and graduate membership for those who are pursuing their first qualification. We have corporate membership for consultancies or um, businesses that have a dedicated claims department. Okay, um, if you would like any more information about any of those, please let me know. I know this was very quick. And now for the benefits, what is in it for our members? Well, we have a member area of our website, which has a knowledge area, which is a collection of research, white papers, articles, et cetera, on construction uh, contracts and claims topics. We have a growing library of templates to help save our members time and ensure that their claims are done correctly. We have regular CPD webinars, such as this one, uh, these are free for the public to attend, but only members get a CPD certificate. We have the ICCP Academy, which is not open to the public. These are um, more technical training sessions on uh, topics of interest to claims practitioners. We have uh, discounts on um, books through Wiley Blackwood. Wiley Blackwell and Rutledge, as well as through our training partner claims class. We have a monthly newsletter to keep our members up to date on what's going on in the industry. We have industry exposure in the form of a public listing of members. And of course, members also get a certificate of membership and logos that they are free to display. 
And we have a private LinkedIn group where members can discuss their claims and uh, contract questions in um, a confidential setting. And finally, the optional uh, benefit of our register of claims practitioners, which is popular with our members who are in consultancies. Okay, I realized that was very fast. Um, if you have requested additional information when you registered for this webinar, I will be sending you an email in the next few days, or you can visit our website, instituteccp.com, or you can email me, jennifer.smith at instituteccp.com. And with that whirlwind tour, I will hand it over to uh, Andy, who will be presenting today's webinar, if I can figure out where my buttons are. Thank you, Jen. Let me just share the screen here. Thank you very much for that uh, quick introduction. Uh, I'm sure many people have heard it before, but, you know, I, I, I really want to uh, encourage people to seriously think about becoming a member. If you are dealing with claims at any level, either preparing them, responding to them, managing them, uh, you, you really need to be on the ball these days. Uh, one of the, the uh, uh, highest level of uh, disputes is caused by inadequately expressed claims. And in fact, I would imagine that inadequately, inadequately responded to claims. So, you know, you, you really do need to bring this up to professional levels. I, I personally have seen many, many claims that would be rejected purely on the fact that they don't include the right sort of information. Uh, and this is something that we're going to talk about today. So there are many, many benefits from being a member. It's not expensive. Uh, we even have uh, preferential rates for people who are living in, in certain listed countries, because we do recognize that, you know, in growing countries, developing countries, uh, people still need the education, they still need the help, they still need uh, to be get, get up to this level. Uh, but, you know, maybe their salaries, their income is not up to the same standard as, as other countries. So uh, we do have these preferential rates. So I please really encourage you to think about joining. As Jen said, look at the website. We are a, a very small and very friendly organisation. You don't speak to some sort of telephone operator. You speak to one of the, the, the managers, the admin people, uh, or in fact, the, the committee. Uh, so please, my encouragement, have a look at the website, see what you think and think about joining us. So today's webinar is all about uh, prolongation cost uh, uh, calculations. Uh, many claims, in fact, this morning, <laughs> To, to give you an example of the fact that we are a small friendly organization and, and, and we try to, you know, be the sort of organization that helps people on an individual basis. Uh, I've spent uh, an hour, an hour and a half just answering questions that have been submitted to by members uh, to the Institute on uh, giving various advice and recommendations. One of them uh, was on the principles of, of cost recovery, which from the question, the person who had raised the issue had, had really very little knowledge of the principles of cost recovery. So hopefully you are here and you will find out today. And hopefully the answer that Jen will be sending you back will also help. So anyway, <clears throat> before we get into the actual calculations, let's just have a look at some of the principles of cost recovery. Uh, the, the, the idea of a, a prolongation cost, sorry, I just need to move my windows about so we're not hiding the slides. If I can get rid of the the photos yet yeah, right with there uh, if if an extension of time is warranted the contractor is obviously going to have to remain on the site and incur his uh, site overheads and in fact his head office overheads for a longer period than was envisaged so if you've got a 12 month contract and you have a one month extension of time you've got one month extra time related charges incurred on both the site and the head office. So that is what prolongation costs are in a nutshell. Cost 
Uh, FIDIC defines, uh, I will refer to FIDIC, but a lot of the principles are applicable to whatever form of standard sort of co construction contract that you may be using. Uh, cost is defined in uh, FIDIC as actual cost incurred. So it's the money that goes out of the contractor's bank account or, or pocket. Uh, what we can't do is calculate the costs associated with the extension of time from the estimated costs included in the preliminaries or general items in the bill of quantities. This, this is where the, the person who raised the query that I was dealing with this morning had got it wrong. In fact, there were two people that had got it wrong. Uh, they, they were trying to uh, calculate the cost based on the pre preliminary items. That That is not acceptable because they are not costs. They are not actual cost incurred. They are, they are estimates. The general legal principle is to place the claimant in the position that he would have been had the breach not occurred. I'll, I'll talk about a breach, but basically a, uh, something that gives rise to an extension of time. Whilst not a breach, because the contract uh, allows for certain things, such as variation, but the, the idea is that you, the contractor should not suffer by an event that the contractor entitles him to an extension of time. But neither, in many cases, may he profit from that. So the cost or loss and expense in, in some legal jurisdictions or contracts is, is all that he can claim. However, uh, sorry, we'll come on to it, this later. Uh, however... Look at the contract, because uh, using FIDIC as an example, certain events will allow just cost to be uh, claimed. And these are events for which the employer has no control, such as force majeure, exceptional events, uh, unforeseeable physical conditions. So the contractor can maintain his position, but can't profit by it. On the other hand, if it's an event that's led to the extension of time that the employer has control of, like issuing variations, like uh, not giving access to the site, like cause giving rise to suspension by not paying, etc., etc., FIDIC will allow for profit, a reasonable profit, to be claimed in addition to the costs. So going back to the slides, Concurrent delay negates the entitlement to claim for costs. I think many people understand this. If there is concurrent delay, and concurrent delay for true cons cons concurrency to occur, a delay by the contractor and a delay by the employer have to occur at the same time. And, and this is something that many people don't appreciate, they both have to affect the time for completion. Otherwise, they are just parallel delays to activities. If this situation occurs, which is actually quite rare, uh, you can claim an extension of time because the principle here is that if the contractor had not delayed, the employer would still have delayed so the contractor can have time. But the contractor cannot claim costs for that for the period of concurrency. And the principle there is that the contractor would have been late anyway, so he may not claim his costs, uh, is already getting uh, the relief from liquidated damages or, or delay penalties, but he can't profit from the situation, so can't claim costs. But when we are looking at things, and especially engineers reviewing claims, you cannot reject the extension of time. Uh, because of concurrency, uh, and contractors don't try to claim your prolongation costs when there are periods of con concurrent delay. You should know whether concurrency exists because you've done your delay analysis uh, when you submit your extension of time claim. Uh, we've already dealt with this. Uh, we talked about profit, so we're not well on that one. The costs should be calculated at the time that the cost was incurred and not for the extended period. So if we look at my analogy, a 12 month contract period, a one month extension of time. And again, some people get this wrong. Uh, the costs that you incur are not for the extra month, because that is when you're uh, demobilizing and your costs are, particular, are, are, are lower but when the delay occurred. So let's say that the delay occurred in month six, 
the cost should be calculated on the cost in being incurred in month six. So the calculation is 30 days costs, but the costs incurred in month six. Uh, we've, we've already said that cost is actual cost, and this needs to de de be demonstrated within your claim by including payroll information, invoices, uh, accounts records, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to verify that the calculations for the cost that you are claiming are actually uh, correct. And Finally, I mean, I, I talk an awful lot on on various subjects, and one of the, uh, the the frequent things is that claims will fail through inadequate record keeping. So, if you are uh, looking at your contract administration systems, the first thing you're going to do is when you're calculating your prolongation costs, is go to month six and calculate what resources were present on the site in terms of management, admin staff, uh, time-related uh, labour, vehicles, plant, equipment, site officers, insurances, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, mm -hmm. But unless you can verify within your claim that those resources were actually deployed to the, the uh, project, uh, don't expect the engineer to say, well, yeah, okay, uh, we, we, we had all these people on site and all this equipment. You need to verify this. You need to substantiate the fact that they were present, both to do your calculations and to uh, substantiate uh, your, your claim to the uh, respondent. To illustrate some cost calculations, we've put together a little case study uh, for, uh, it's actually one that uh, we use as claims class for, for an example for our students. Uh, so this is based on one of the case studies, the Red Rose Apartments. So let's have a look at some uh, an event and then look at the costs that arise that are claimable from this event. So we've got a five-story apartment building uh, containing luxury apartments, uh, and a ground floor retail area with basement parking. Uh, during the basement excavation, uh, a, a pipe was uncovered, which wasn't supposed to be there. It didn't uh, exist on any geotech. And the site was supposed to have been handed over to the contractor with all subsurface services, etc., removed. Uh, this took some time to resolve. Uh, the engineer had to go back to the authority and, and find out what the pipe was, what it did, whether it was live, etc. Uh, and that delayed the basement excavation by 20 days. During that 20 day period, uh, the excavator and six laborers were standing idle during the period of delay. As you can imagine, if we're on the basement excavation, we can't re redeploy uh, those resources to another part of the works. Uh, the basement excavation and, and construction is always going to be uh, on the critical path. The delay analysis following that demonstrated that whilst there was a 20 day delay to the excavation, uh, because there was some float in the program, the time for completion was de delayed by 13 days due to the uh, problem with the pipe. So we got a 20 day delay uh, in the first month and it, it, that led to a 13 day uh, delay to the time for completion. So what can we claim? Well, firstly, uh, we can claim for the cost for the 20-day standing time from the 1st to the 20th of August, 2018. The, these are dates from the case study, by the way. We can claim for 13 days prolongation costs, which were incurred during August. Oh, so so that's it. That's what we can claim for. Obviously, we're claiming for an extension of time, but that's not the subject of this uh, this webinar. So let's have a look at the calculations. Uh, and this is the sort of calculation, the, the way that you should be uh, presenting your calculations within your claim. Before we actually get into the numbers, however, ju just look at the format here. Firstly, it's very, very clear. All the information uh, we need is, is, is at the top of the, uh, the, the spreadsheet. The claimant, Johnson Construction Group, the project, Red Rose Apartments, 
what this this piece of paper is. They are the cost calculations for standing time. Uh, is revision one, and it's dated the 28th of September 2018. And it's got a name. It's an appendix cost two. So it will be included within the appendix cost two of the claim. It's in a bill of quantities format. We've got items, 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. 1 We've got an additional column to uh, a bill of quantities because we are cross-referencing this calculation with the calculation for the rate per day for the various resources. So in order to find, if we look at the first line item, how that £84.71p has been calculated, you need to refer to calculation reference HP1, which should also be included within your claim. And we're going to look at these calculations of the daily rates in, in more detail once we've been through this. So each item is broken down. The first one is we've got six labourers, 20 days standing equals 120 days, man days, and the rate per day is £84.71, which brings us to a total of £10,000 and, and, and a few others. We've got the same for an excavator driver. We've got the same for the excavator. And my apologies, it should not say man days. It should say days. But everything there, and this is what I really want to, uh, to make the point of, everything there is very, very easily understood by a non-quantity surveyor, non-cost engineer, non-accountant. It is self-explanatory. We've even include, included a little calculation within the description, six labourers times 20 days, and that's where the 120 man days comes from. So it's very, very simple. Anybody that can follow that. Now, I've seen many, many spreadsheets calculating prolongation costs, and they arrive, and it is a complete nightmare. Spreadsheets are great. You can put all sorts of information in. But even as a, a, an ex-quantity surveyor, I, I look at these spreadsheets and I've got no idea what the numbers represent. People haven't gone to the trouble to explain the units. They haven't gone to the trouble to explain how calculations have been done. Sure, somewhere in a cell, there's a complicated calculation to work something out. But how do I know that? So keep it simple. Make sure that the person who is a non-expert can understand your calculations. If we come on now to the prolongation cost, as opposed to the standing time, uh, we've got a similar sort of calculation. And we, I, I like to break it down into various, if you like, cost headings. So this one is for site uh, management, supervision, administration, and non-productive staff, all of which are time-related. They are not uh, 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 earning money by actually carrying out work. These are your, your site overheads, uh, in, in other words. So again, uh, first column is an item, cross-reference in the second column to the calculation of the daily rate. We've got the uh, names and the designation of the staff. We've got a project manager, construction manager, contract administrator, site engineer, a planner, a quantity surveyor and an HEC HSE manager who are working uh, or looking after two projects in the case of the QS and three projects in the case of the HSE manager. So again, a little calculation, 50% of time or 33% of time, which relates to instead of 13 days, six and a half days, 4.33 days. We've got a groundworks foreman and we've got a van driver uh, dedicated to the project. So very, very simple. The quantity times the daily rate equals the total prolongation cost for that 13 day period for all these persons. Second category is site establishment. And I hope you can read it. The, the, the spreadsheet, because of the, the printing, is a little bit small. But here we include uh, the contractor's site officers, the engineer's officers, the messing hut for the labour, uh, some storage containers, site fencing and hoarding, 
contractors and, and engineers office furniture and equipment such as photocopiers or maybe not photocopiers that's separate but uh, furniture desks chairs conference tables uh, kettles teacups etc uh, the contractors and engineers computers and IT that that is if in actual fact it's part of the contract for the uh, contractor to provide IT facilities for the engineers uh, the contractors telephone and internet same for the engineer electricity uh, for the site officers photocopiers one for the engineer one for the uh, for the contractor and security services and again all these have been brought down in another calculation to the daily rate and and we'll see these are either rental or they are depreciation uh, of the contractors owned equipment and resources so that's the site establishment. We look at transport. This is very early in the project. Obviously, we're just excavating the bakes basement, so we don't have a lot of transport allocated to the project, but the project manager has a company car, so it was the construction manager. We've got at this point a van uh, that's dedicated to the site. Possibly later, they will have additional uh, transport and whatever. Uh, and all these, of course, need fuel. So again, there's a little note here uh, to look at exhibit C100, which will contain uh, the fuel that have been charged from the accounts department to the project for those vehicles. And you could have, we, we could also have uh, fuel diesel that's necessary for uh, plant on site. Non-productive plant and equipment. So this is different. On, we, we have plant and equipment on the site which is deployed <coughs> for maybe the whole of the project, uh, such as a, a generator for the electricity for the site officers, uh, or may be brought to site for a certain amount of time. So for example, a tower crane, it will maybe be brought out after, uh, onto site after a couple of months, but then deployed maybe once the superstructure has been completed, or, or, or sorry, demobilized. So whatever resources you've got during that delay period uh, will be time related for that period. As opposed to plant and equipment, such as let's say an excavator that is brought to site, it does the excavation, it earns money through the, uh, the activities that it's involved in and gets paid through the, the, if you like, the bill of quantities, and then is demobilized and sent off site once it's got no uh, uh, no uh, productive work to, uh, to to carry out. So at the moment on this site, again, it's early days. We've got a dumper, we've got a forklift for materials handling, and we've got some uh, uh, surveying equipment. We've got uh, a, a still saw. That that that's about it. Uh, again, the 13 days multiplied by the daily, daily cost brings us down to a total uh, for this line item of £2,123. We also have uh, expenses which we must incur uh, because we, we are obliged to provide such things as a performance bond or guarantee an advance payment guarantee if that's part of the contract and project specific insurances which it will be required by the contract again these come at a cost if we've got to maintain these for a, th a further 13 days because of the extension of time we will have to pay the bank or the the companies that have organized these things that are providing these things for an extra 13 days cover so we need to be claiming for this it's a legitimate time-related cost. Finance costs. Uh, obviously, this is a little bit laughable as we work through this calculation here. Uh, when we are into the project, uh, every payment uh, we, we receive will retain an amount for retention. Now, if we can't get that retention released, for an extra 13 days, we will have to continue as the contractor to finance the borrowing of the money to cover that retention. So there is a financial cost for hanging or not being having the retention release for an extra 13 days in this instance. 
Now, you'll see as we work through the calculation here, th this is month one of this particular project. So the, the amount of retention deducted is not great. Uh, but please follow this as the, as the principle. Remember what I was saying earlier about showing you calculations very, very clearly so a non-expert can understand them. Let's just work this one down. So the retention deducted from interim payment certificate number one was 33,707. The bank interest per annum is 2.5%. So that brings it down to a calculation to the, 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 the financing cost was 842 pounds. That is per year, of course, because it's 2.5% per annum. Divide it by 365 days a year, and we come to the finance cost per day of £2.31. Uh, I told you it wasn't a big deal. Uh, multiplied by 13 days, it is £30. But you would imagine it's a big project, and you're into month 9 or 10 of your 12-month project. The amount of retention that is being with, withheld is significant. So applying this same calculation to, I don't know, uh, $100,000 will be fairly significant, and it is claimable. And finally, <clears throat> head office overheads. There are certain established ways of calculating head office overheads, uh, which, which are acceptable to courts and acceptable to arbitrators. Uh, and uh, the one that we've chosen to uh, to use here is called Emden's formula. A little bit of a handy hint here. If you've heard of the Society of Construction Law, <coughs> you can go to their website and you can download a calculator. It's a simple spreadsheet. You just enter the, the data for the project, uh, the extension of time, etc., uh, and uh, it will calculate using three or four different formulas what the head office overhead should be. Uh, we've happened to use Emden's on this one, and the formula is the annual company head office overheads and profit divided by the annual company turnover will bring a uh, down to a percentage of overheads and profit. So we can apply that percentage to the contract sum, which will apportion the value of this project to the other projects that the contractor is working on, excuse me, <coughs> multiplied by the days of delay, in this case 13, and divided by the contract period in days. Is So there is the amount recoverable. And we'll, we should put the figures into the calculation on the next page. What I like to do, either as a contractor making a claim or what I like to see as a engineer responding to a claim or as an adjudicator, is not just one year's profit and turnover, <coughs> excuse me, but an average over the last three years. Uh, contractors can have ups and downs in turnover, in profitability, uh, in, uh, and of course, the the the. Uh, financial climate can change. Uh, I did work on one project where I was responding to claims on behalf of the employer, uh, and the contractor had claimed a very high percentage of profit. Now, I knew because of the financial situation, it was, it was just following 2018, that the contractor had <laughs> bought, not bought, but won this this project in a time when it was really a buyer's market. It was after the financial crisis. And, you know, contractors were going in at zero profit margins just to keep the turnover and keep their uh, their, their staff employed. So uh, I, I had to go back. I had to think about this. And I, I, I said, look, Mr. Contractor, you, OK, you've given me your audit and accounts, but those accounts were in the good times for contractors pre-financial crash. You tendered for this project after that point. So 
I can't believe that the the head office, the the the, the profit levels that you were you were uh, earning before the crash will be the same as now. And the contractor, to be fair, you know, it, it wasn't trying to. Uh, I think it was just naivety. I don't think it was trying to uh, get away with anything. Uh, he saw my point, and and we agreed on a lesser amount. So and that's what it's all about: agreeing claims, isn't it? Anyway, in normal circumstances, uh, I like to take the average over the past three years from the audited account. So plug those figures in and we can see in this case for the uh, 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 Red Rose Business Centre, uh, the annual turnover, the overheads and profit comes from the, the, the average shown on the previous sheet. The contract sum is 12 million. The contract period is 548 days. The days of delay is 13. We apply that to the formula, do the maths, and we will come out to head office overheads of £20,993. So there we go. And of course, we need to bring all that to a summary within our claim. Uh, so we've got the costs incurred due to standing time, site management, supervision, admin, non-productive staff, site establishment, transport, non-productive plant and equipment, contractual costs, financial costs, head office overheads and profit. Now, in this case, uh, because this was an unforeseeable site condition, you're not allowed to claim profit on this. In another case, you may be able to add a, add a percentage for profit to that £58,000. So there we go. That is exactly what you should be included in your claim. And that, if you are an engineer or an, ad, uh, an adjudicator, I don't think you would have any problems whatsoever in understanding those calculations. Unlike those spreadsheets that I've received in the past that I've got no clue what they actually mean. If you, uh, the, uh, the respondent can't understand your claim, he will he or she will no way be making an award. So I said that the daily rates need to be subject to a separate calculation, and we'll go through some of these. These calculations, again, need to be included within it, in your claim. So that when we're looking at uh, the site management and admin staff, we can see that the project manager, Mr. Woodward, uh, costs the company uh, £272.10p per day to employ. That is the cost calculation. Again, it's very, very simple. It's got the name of the project. It's got a revision number, a date. It's got a name, appendix cost SS, site staff. Uh, and it's laid out in a way that explains how the calculations have been brought about, uh, how everything is calculated. And again, very, very simple to explain. Let's just take an example here. Uh, we've got our project manager, Mr. Woodward. We've got substantiation also included in the claim, Exhibit C01. It could be uh, it, it, uh, Mr. Woodward's contract, it could be his, his salary slip, it could be his pay advice, it could be just records from the accounts payroll system, which shows that he has a salary of 80,000 per month uh, per, per annum. Uh, he has an annual bonus, it's company policy to give annual bonuses. We don't know what this year's is going to be, but uh, it's reasonable uh, if we use the uh, the previous year's bonus, and there's a little note at the bo bottom to say annual bonus is the amount paid during 2017. These calculations don't always have to be down to the last dollar or pound in this case. They need to be reasonable, however. So if you don't have the information, include something reasonable, but explain why it's reasonable, which we've done on that note. Uh, it doesn't have a car allowance because it's provided with a company vehicle. Uh, legislation uh, in the UK means that uh, the employer has to pay 13.8% uh, uh, insurance contributions, and that would be applied on the salary plus the bonus. Uh, we have a pension scheme within the company, which is 7.5% of the salary. Uh, that's the contributed by the by the company, not the employer. 
So that brings us down to a cost per annum for Mr. Woodward of about £99,000, which, if we then divided by 365 days, uh, brings it down to our magic figure of 272. Some of you may be thinking, well, you know, Mr. Woodward doesn't work 365 days a year. You know, there are public holidays, there are vacations, there are sick time, etc. Uh, well, you know, Mr. Woodward is allocated to that project. So whether he's sick, is on public holiday or is on his vacation, the this project still incurs the cost because he still earns a salary whilst, whilst these things are happening. Why do we bring it down to 365 days? Why do we bring it down to, in fact, a daily cost? Because the site doesn't run at weekends. It doesn't run at public holidays, etc. It just makes life easier to do that. And I've seen people trying to calculate the daily cost work. It worked on five days or six days a week, depending on what the project works. But uh, do we always work five days or six days? Sometimes we might come in on a Saturday to catch up some delays. Uh, and it gets incredibly complicated. What happens if there's a two-day uh, public holiday in the middle of the month? It, even more calculated. So bring everything down to a cost per calendar day. Your extension of time is calculated in calendar days. It's not know, seven days uh, plus, uh, I'm trying to do the maths in my head, including a couple of weekends. It's 13 calendar days. So this just makes it simple, makes it easy to follow, and it makes your calculations simple and easy to follow. The more complicated you make your calculations, the more chance there is of making a mistake, and certainly the more chance of the respondent who is reviewing the claim will not be able to understand it or will find reasons to disagree with it. So the principle is the KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. So. That's the salary. We've also got uh, certain certain categories of, of hourly paid labour. Now, we don't have to, unlike the, the, the management, et cetera, we don't have to calculate each and every labour or mason or carpenter or electrician on a separate basis, even though they may be earning different amounts of money for whatever reason. We can take an average cost for a labourer, a plant driver, a transport driver, an electrician, whatever. So let's look at the first line item here. Labourers, Exhibit C10. Again, payroll information or uh, possibly union uh, rates or whatever. The hourly rate is £11 per hour. We work for eight and a half hours per shift. So the daily cost comes to £93.50. Uh, the labourers are given a £11 a day travelling allowance, which is added to it. So we get a cost per day of £104.50. Insurance again, same as we had before, 13.8%. Uh, no pension for hourly paid uh, labour in, in, in this particular instance. So the cost per working day is £118.92. We need to convert that to a calendar day. So there's a little note at the bottom. The cost per calendar day is the cost per working day multiplied by five working days per week, multiplied by 52 weeks a year, divided by 365 days per year. We've explained how we've found, how we've calculated that figure. So we come to a cost per day of £84.71. And the other uh, different designations, different uh, different trades, etc., are calculated in a, in a in the same way. When we get down to hire and rental, obviously the contractor will hire certain things in. He'll have his own equipment, which we'll deal with later, but uh, uh, he will rent a lot of things. So let's have a look at this. Uh, Slightly different, less columns on this because the calculation is less uh, complicated. But let's look at the first item uh, first. It's our excavator. Uh, it's been hired from Delagio uh, Plant Hire. We've got uh, an exhibit to substantiate it, which would in this case be an invoice. Uh, the uh, rental cost is £25 per hour. Uh, we work, the excavator works for eight hours. 
So the cost per day is 20 times eight hours is 200 pounds. Let's have a look at the next item. Uh, the source of, for the storage containers, the internal, which means that it's something that the contractor has bought for general use, uh, and then they are hired out to the project. And it is quite usual for a contractor to have its own plant and equipment and have as a separate cost centre within the company uh, a, a plant hire or, or a plant and equipment cost centre. So in effect, what happens internally is those storage containers will be rented out and the project will be charged a certain amount per month for the use of those containers. So whatever it is, uh, we've got probably for Exhibit 21 would be the, the monthly cost transfer from the, the project and the, and the uh, internal payment to the uh, plant and equipment department. So whatever it is, it's £80 per month. So there's a calculation here to get to the daily cost, 12, multiplied by 12 months, divided by 365 days, is a daily cost of not a lot, £2.63. Uh, if we look at, have we got any other... Uh, uh, examples the photocopiers rented from office lease leasing uh, the cost is 200 pounds per month multiplied by 12 divided by 365 six pound 58 a day uh, have we got anything else that we can look at that, that you can see the calculation the important thing is here is that we have shown the calculations. We've shown how that £200, £2.63, £3.95 has been calculated. And that with the exhibits, uh, the invoices, the internal transfers, etc., will satisfy any engineer when they are auditing your costs. I've already referred to the fact that uh, contractors will often buy plant equipment, etc., in uh, and then use it for however long it lasts. Uh, so we, we've got no rental calculation here, uh, but the, the the contractor would depreciate uh, each year a percentage of the initial capital cost until it's been paid for uh, uh, through the through the company. So if we look at the, in this case, the contractor bought the site officers uh, for uh, two site officers, one at, at 24,000, one at 17,000, and another engineer's office at 17,000, bought those new for the project. So the exhibit there would be the capital cost uh, for, for those three sets of officers. The depreciation period in months, which accountants have rules and regulations as to how, how long they can depreciate things uh, over, uh, would be 48 months. If this is a 12-year contract, a 12-year, sorry, 12-month contract, those offices are going to be used for the other three years of their useful life or whatever is on, on other projects. So we can't claim all that capital cost. So we need to depreciate it. The depreciation would be the capital cost divided by the depreciation period. So that would give a depreciation period in the first one of £500 a month. We do our little calculation, multiplied by 12, divided by 365, and it brings us down to a cost per day for depreciation. And the same goes for the, the mess or the office furniture and equipment, uh, the computers and IT equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the depreciation period, as I say, contractors, speak to your accountants, they will have rules and they will be using those rules when they do the, uh, the company uh, accounts. Site overheads, uh, fairly simple here. We've got telephones and internets, we've got electricity, we've got security services, and we've got fuel costs. Uh, usually the accounts, well, not usually, always, the accounts will be charging the project, uh, uh, whatever it is based on the invoices. So the exhibits in this case would be the invoices from the suppliers uh, and whatever the cost is based on the that invoice. And don't forget, uh, you know, we are talking about the cost during August in, in our example. So we'll be looking at the uh, uh, telephone and internet, electricity, fuel costs 
for that month, two, uh, August 2018. And we bring it again down to a cost per calendar day. Uh, contractual cost calculations, we've got performance security uh, and uh, advanced payment guarantee and insurances. The providers are listed. The uh, exhibits would be the uh, usually the invoices for the premium, and they're usually charged at a cost per annum. So again, bringing it down to divided by 365, we have our cost per day. So that's it. That shows you and gives you examples. And I don't mind if you copy my templates when you're doing your cost calculations, uh, but that's the sort of level of professionalism that you should be reaching if you want your prolongation costs to be accepted by the engineer. If you are an engineer or an adjudicator or whatever, that's the sort of level that you should expect the claimant to be giving you the information. If it gives you 28 spreadsheets with numbers that you've got no idea how they've been calculated, what they represent, send it back and ask the contractor to do a better job. And then you can audit the accounts and, and uh, verify that the claim is correct. So in summary, very quickly, principles of cost recovery. We can claim costs. We can't claim prelims and, and general items. Cost is actual cost incurred. The costs need to be calculated for the costs incurred during the time of the delay, not the extended period. Uh, concurrent delay will negate your entitlement, true concurrency this is, uh, to claim for costs. What else have we got? Anyway, that's on the slides. The resources should be based on the project records. So you need your project records should be showing that during the month of August on our project, the Red Rose Apartments, Mr. Woodward, Mr. Lucy, all those people, all that equipment, all that plant, all those site resources were actually deployed to, to, the, uh, to the project and therefore you were incurring those costs. Reduce all costs to the cost per calendar day, which we've talked about. Each cost heading should be shown separately. So, you know, again, we see contractors trying to uh, shortcut work. It, it, it is hard work it, it, to, 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 to present these calculations. It, it's a little bit laborious. But once you've done it once, I mean, I, I, when I was a claims consultant, I had spreadsheets all pre-formatted for this stuff. So if I was doing a claim for contractor one, I would just fill the, the blanks in on, on my pre-formatted spreadsheet. Then I'd do the same for contractor two or whatever. Uh, but each cost should be shown separately. So it should be, uh, uh, it may be individually audited. Not here is the payroll uh, for, the, for the project for the month of August. Now, that's not telling the respondent anything what is what is included in that payroll are they actually time related costs so within the payroll figure that you, you're using have we got production related costs have we got you know that the tradespeople who are actually doing the work they're not time related not they therefore they can't be, be claimed as prolongation costs uh, the daily cost for each cost item should be calculated and shown, as we saw in the second uh, set of calculations. Each cost should be clearly substantiated from the payroll and or the accounts record. So include this information within your claim with cross-references. So when the uh, engineer or respondent is checking the calculations, they can quickly find the invoice for the excavator hire that is this amount per month or per hour. Uh, do yourself a favor and help the people who are responding to your claim. Add explanations of the calculations where necessary. Again, I'm gonna stress it again, so a non-expert can understand your calculations. Include cross-references for easy auditing. So there we go. That brings us to the end of this little webinar. I just want to take a notice, uh, a short moment to uh, give uh, Claims Class a, a, bit, a bit of a commercial break. Uh, as you possibly know, Claims Class is the training provider for the ICCP. 
Uh, all ICCP members get a reduced price on any claims class courses. And just very quickly, I will run through uh, the sort of uh, uh, courses and education that claims class offers. Topics, construction claims, the perfect claim, uh, that the, the perfect claim uh, works the way through a claim. And that example that we've used is actually from uh, th this example that we use for the uh, the case study we use for the perfect claim. Understanding claims under the FIDIC contracts, practical use of the FIDIC contracts. Uh, this uh, at the moment is FIDIC 1999, but we are working on FIDIC 2017. Uh, delay analysis, that should be launched this year. Uh, and uh, a new one, contract management for non-contractual experts. So for project managers, construction managers, those who don't know the intricacies, intricacies of the, the, the contract, but need to know uh, the principles for good management of projects. Uh, Claims class courses can be studied uh, live online. Uh, so you sign into a weekly uh, webinar in-person workshops so we can come to you and, and train your people within your company. Uh, we used to uh, hire a hotel room and sell tickets, but you know everything now has gone to online. Uh, or self-study e-courses, so you can go through the courses at your own pace and put as much time as you wish uh, and take as long as you like to complete the course. Uh, E-courses we offer on, on uh, a range of levels, so basic, which is just the tutorials, or intermediate or premium courses where you will need to uh, study a little bit yourself, uh, submit assignments, uh, you will be supported by a tutor who, who will guide and, and assist you, uh, and your assignments will be graded until eventually uh, you, you graduate. Uh, that's really what I've just said there. So there we go. Uh, that was a little plug for claims class. Again, as the ICCP, uh, please have a look at our website. It's uh, pretty well done. There's some good information there. And if you are interested in, uh, in furthering your education and becoming more of an expert and more professional, uh, give us a call, chat to us. Uh, we, we are very friendly and very helpful. So question time. Uh, over to Jen. Uh, I can see there's a few waiting in the box. Yeah, so, we've got, uh, sorry. Do this or will you? Okay, um, so yeah, we've got some good questions. Um, once we get through Paul's question, then we do have two people with their hands up um, that got their hands up after Paul got his question in. So just to keep them in order. Okay, uh, first question. Please, could you tell an example for the profit included in a prolongation cost? I'm not quite sure what you mean by this. Do you mean what level of profit should be 5%, 10% or whatever? Or do you mean what type of events can you claim profit from? Uh, I think I've already explained that the contract will tell you if you can claim profit or not depending on the type of claimable event. As for the percentage, FIDIC in 99 said reasonable profit. So maybe you've got to go back to the contractor's audited accounts uh, to establish what is reasonable profit. Uh, FIDIC uh, 2017 requires the parties to agree a profit level within the contract. So if that's the case, uh, you have to apply that percentage profit that you've agreed when you entered into the contract. Different forms of contract may treat it differently. Uh, so, sorry, I, I hope that uh, that answers the question. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question says, in one of my projects, the contractors, all overheads, site and head office, and profits have been distributed in all the BOQ rates as 9% and 13%. Can we use the Hudson formula to calculate prolongation costs and profits rather than calculating actual cost? No. <laughs> Basically, cost is cost. <coughs> uh, your 
whatever site overheads and profit have been included within your rates or or your uh, your preliminaries i mean they're either one or the other you probably have uh, uh, overheads and profit on all of your rates they are estimates the contract will require and the law will require for you to just recover your actual cost incurred so you have to prove and demonstrate the actual cost incurred so no you can't use those percentages can we use hudson's formula to calculate prolongation costs and profit uh, well no hudson's formula like, like endon's formula is used to calculate head office overheads and profit so that would only be part of the calculation as we should as we saw with the calculation you've got your site overhead costs and you've got your head office overheads and profit uh, so the formula can only be used to calculate your head office overheads and profit so if you if you're looking for a a quick and easy fix for this there isn't one uh, you need to analyze your costs and you need to do those calculations. Uh, uh, we've given the example in the way that we've given the examples today. Yes, it's uh, it's a bit of a, a long-winded thing to do. But if you're on a large project and you've got half a million dollars worth of uh, costs that are claimable, uh, it's definitely worth putting the effort in. Uh, if you are not going to put the effort in, just expect the engineer to reject it because you've not uh, demonstrated actual cost and you've not uh, substantiate that they were the actual costs that were incurred. Sorry if that's not what you wanted to hear, but th that's the truth. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving right along because the question box is filling up. Uh, the next question, you mentioned the SCL formula spreadsheet. I have used this a few times, but in some instances, the different formulas produce widely different results. Do you have any thoughts on why this would be and which one would you choose? Highest, lowest, the middle one, or an average of all three? Yeah, a, a good point, Russell. I've I've also done this, and if you get into the the the, the depth of it, you you this is where lawyers come in and argue the case, isn't it? You know, they, they always want to justify their fees, uh, but you know, certain certain of the formulas would be more suitable for this situation or that situation or the other situation. I tend not to go uh, into that uh, if I'm preparing a claim or in fact, if I'm reviewing a claim, if it's one or the other, it's reasonable. But what I, I, I'll share a little secret here. What I like to do if I'm preparing a claim uh, for a contractor is actually include within the claim, the uh, SCL formula spreadsheet, and then say, these are all the different answers, but I'm I'm a good contractor. I don't want to uh, gain unnecessarily out of this. I will. I, I am asking for the lowest number. Now that puts you in good stead with anybody reviewing the claim or any adjudicators. I don't want the highest one. Don't even want the middle one. I'll go for the lowest one. The main point is you're claiming for something, Russell. That if you didn't claim for it, you wouldn't get anything. Yeah. So that's my little trick. And uh, I think if you were an engineer or or, or an employer, you, you would realize that the contractor is trying to be reasonable here and, and not grabbing every single dollar that he can. Is the contractor entitled to claim reasonable profit on top of the cost, which includes head office overheads and profit? What is the difference between the two profits? Uh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's a little bit subtle, and I didn't explain it within the uh, in the webinar. Uh, I, I think I've already said uh, that the contract will tell you on, under the particular type of claim it is, uh, whether you can claim for just cost or cost plus reasonable profit. Now, this profit is different to the contractor's overheads and profit calculated through the uh, the various formulas that we've just talked about. Uh, the formulas allow uh, something for the, the, the fact that the contractor, if he's working on the site for longer than uh, he should be, he's got his res resources tied up and that prevents him from using those resources on a different project 
an earning profit. So that is loss of profit, and that is allowed for within the Hudson's, Emden's, Etchley's formula. Uh, what we're talking about on the, if you like, the site overheads costs is a, a nominal amount, a pre-agreed amount or an agra- uh, amount to be demonstrated for the, where the contractor gets a little bit on top of his costs. And as I said recently, uh, uh, at the beginning, FIDIC allocates that based on if it's the employer's fault rather than a neutral event, uh, the, the contractor can uh, have profit. So it's not loss of profit, in the cal- which is covered in the calculation. This is just profit for the, uh, the fact that the employer's messed you about and caused you a delay. Uh, I hope that helps, Paul. Uh, next question is, uh, for head office overheads, other than use of formula, why would the cost not be presented in a more detailed and calculated manner as some people assessing claims see it as too easy money to be paid without much substantiation? <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Gregory. Uh well, I, I would imagine if you imagine a contractor who's got maybe twenty projects on the go, how would how would you actually do that? Is it possible? I, I doubt that it would be. Well, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it would be incredibly, uh, imp- incredibly difficult to allocate. How much time does the accountant spend uh, dealing with matters for the project in question? How much time does the human resources people, personnel, spend dealing with the project in question? How much of the head office electricity costs should be allocated to people dealing with the project in question? You can see why this is difficult. And this that's precisely why these, these formulas have been developed and precisely why uh, uh, they are accepted ways of calculating the the head office overheads and profit. Uh, So when you say some people assessing claims see it as too easy money to be paid without much substantiation, that's not really correct, Gregory. Uh, It's not easy money. It It is cost that the contractor has incurred. You know, you cannot deny that if his is servicing from head office a project for a, a, another two months, three months, six months, whatever, it's costing the contractor money. And these uh, these these uh, calculations calculate that. So and, and, and calculate it on real figures. The, the, the calculations come from the contractor's audited accounts. So based on the contractor's turnover, the pro, uh, and and the contractors' overheads and, and actual profit achieved on previous years. So uh, it is substantiated, uh, and it's not easy money. It's it's money that the contractor is justly entitled to. So you know the, these these people that see it as I'm reading your question here. Uh, some people assessing claims see it as too easy money. Well, you know, if if judges and adjudicators and arbitrators don't see it like that, uh, maybe the people who are assessing the claims uh, should have another think about it. Uh, I hope that helps, Gregory. All right, great. Thank you. Moving right along to the next question. How do you deal with day works when dealing with prolongation claims? For example, when the contractor has been working on day work. Uh, uh, Just to explain to other people, the contractor would be paid per hour for the plant and equipment, the the labor uh, that that is working so that the time and materials will be recorded. Uh, In that case, those resources are working productively. They are earning money. They are not time-related costs, so therefore those resources would not be claimable as prolongation costs. You see the difference between uh, a, a, a a bunch of uh, site workers uh, working on day works and getting paid uh, for the number of hours they expend, and the project manager, who is a time-related cost, is there from day one to to mobilization day. And whether you're doing any work or you're not doing any work, that is still incurring that cost to the company to employ that project manager on the project. So uh, I hope that answers your question. 
Okay, right. And I will just point out, we've had a bunch of people say thank you for the presentation, uh, but moving straight into the next question, what if the contract does not have a clause for dispute resolution? Can we still claim prolongation time losses? Dispute resolution is nothing to do with what you're entitled to claim for. Dispute resolution is only kicks in if you cannot agree the claim. So uh, claim for what you're entitled to claim under the contract and do it properly. Put your claims in, make them professional, make them include all the information that the respondent will need to uh, deal with the claim. Uh, then you shouldn't have a dispute. But the fact that a dispute resolution uh, clause is not included in the contract does not negate your ability and your entitlement to make the claim. And for, for and I'm talking about any claim. Uh, it doesn't have to be just for uh, prolongation costs. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, thank you, Andy. Wonderful presentation as usual. Uh, I would appreciate if you would explain again how a contractor can calculate the prolongation cost in case of concurrency. Thank you. Uh, hi, Maha, and thank you for the compliment. Uh, uh, you are very welcome. Uh, it's very simple. If there is concurrent delay, you cannot claim prolongation costs. So that's, that's short and sweet. You cannot claim. You get time, but you don't get money. All right. <laughs> nice to see you, Ronald, an old friend. Excellent. Okay. So, um, Ronald asks Can a contractor claim for an increase in price when the contract does not provide for price adjustment? Uh, well, there's nothing to do with prolongation costs, Ronald. You're trying to sneak in a request for some. <laughs> So some some additional advice, but in brief, no. Un unless uh, uh, there is reason, if if the if it's just a case of the the costs of uh, labour and materials have gone up, if there is no uh, provision within the contract which allows for you to claim for increases, I'm sorry. Uh, this is a question that's been asked many many times since COVID. Uh, I'm sorry, but you can't claim. Okay. The next person asks. The project has multiple buildings included in its scope of works. One building got delayed due to late delivery of materials. However, the resources were transferred to other areas. When the contractor claims for EOT, is this a valid claim? Well, yes. If if the uh, if if the one building that was delayed affects the time for completion, you're entitled to an extension of time. Uh, presumably, it, uh, if you're on sectional completion, I, I, I don't know. If you've got four buildings, each might have a, a separate sectional completion date. So we need to look at that. But assuming that four buildings and it's one completion date, if building number one was delayed and delays the time for completion for the project, you are entitled to an extension of time. Okay, thank you. Um, what happens if the claimant fails to substantiate a cost? Well, put yourself in the position of the engineer. If somebody came to you and asked for $100,000, uh, you would Im immediately ask why, and why is it $100,000 and not $100? You would need substantiation of how that $100,000 has been calculated. Otherwise, there's no way that you are able professionally or morally or uh, to or probably legally, I don't know, uh, to, to make an award. So yeah, I think you can answer your own question. Uh, if you don't substantiate a cost, you can't have anything. Ooh, harsh words there. All right. Um, <laughs> harsh, harsh, but real, realistic. True, true. All right, our next question is, uh, what about claiming for claims manager costs for preparing the claim? Thomas, you're always on top of things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's nice to see you here. Uh, claim, the, the cost of preparing a claim is not claimable. And the rationale behind this is that the contract includes 
for if there's a claim situation, you have to prepare your claim and submit it if you're going to get anything. Now, the, the, the accepted argument is that you can't claim for something that you are contractually uh, obliged to do. It's part of your contract. If there are no claims, you don't have a cost. We can contemplate that there would probably be claims on, on many construction contracts. So you need to have allowed for claim preparation, whatever that is, uh, within your price. Uh, the obverse to that, the argument that I would use being primarily a contractor's background is that, well, Mr. Employer, had you not given us cause to make a claim, I wouldn't have had to go out and employ a very expensive claims consultant uh, to help me do it or deploy, deploy an extra member of staff from head office that's got some expertise. So, uh, But generally, and the, the SCL, the Society of Construction Law, will, will, uh, will support this, uh, preparation of claims costs aren't claimable. Now, having said that, another one of Andy's little secrets is that very often I will, I will say to our clients, well, let, let's put the costs in, uh, and then uh, the engineer will probably reject them, but that's just showing that if, if this is something that we can allow to be negotiated out to allow the engineer to do a job and uh, uh, look good in front of the employer. So that's a little bit of strategy, strategy there. Uh, you will also get... You'll get certain claims consultants that will come along and say, yeah, we'll charge you all this money for preparing your claim, but it's OK, you can claim it back. Uh, be very, very wary of any claims consultant or lawyer uh, that, that gives you that information uh, because you can't really claim it back. So anybody that gives uh, that tells you, no, it won't cost you anything because we claim it back for the employer. Uh, don't trust that answer. Right, thanks, Thomas. All right, thank you. Okay, the next question is, how do you compute the loss of opportunity costs for, for resources stuck at a project due to prolongation of the contract? Uh, that is taken into account in the, uh, the head office overheads and loss of profit calculation. Are disruption claims and prolongation claims similar? No, they're, they're entirely different. Uh, prolongation costs, as we've talked about today, is to compensate the contractor for the additional costs is incurred for head office and site office over, uh, site overheads because of an extension of time. Disruption is where you incur additional costs because you cannot work as efficiently as you should be able to. So either you're using more resources to achieve the same output or you are achieving less output with the same resources. Entirely separate, uh, entirely different form of, uh, type of uh, claim. OK, thank you. Uh, the next question, many contracts say that all risk of idling lies with the contractor. Uh, the authority will not take the responsibility can we still claim for losses under the prolongation head? Uh, well, I've, I've not come across any contracts that say that all risk of idling lies with the contractor. If the employer or, or a, an event that is uh, included in the contract prevents you from using your resources, uh, then that is a cost that you're incurring and generally you're able to, to claim for those costs. So if you take out my example that we use, the standing time for the six labourers and the excavator, uh, that was idling cost, standing time, uh, generally claimable. Uh, that's got nothing to do with uh, prolongation costs, which are directly related to the additional time that you're obliged to uh, spend on site because of a, a cause that's entitled you to an extension of time. So I hope that helps, Adop. Is the associated prolongation cost only limited to preliminaries? Uh, again, it's nothing to do with preliminaries. It's certainly the type of resources that you would be claiming for 
or time related resources which would be listed in the preliminaries or general items but uh, we said several times that you cannot claim you can cannot calculate the costs uh, based on the prices in preliminaries yeah, certainly you, generally when you're pricing the job you will put your site overheads in the preliminary section of the bill of quantities uh, but you cannot use any of that information to uh, uh, to, uh, to 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 uh, on to on which to base your calculations. It has to be actual resources deployed at actual cost. Okay, thank you. Next question: How would you calculate the depreciation cost of plant and equipment if invoices are not available since the internal equipment is old? Uh, you'll probably find if it's that old, it's been depreciated many years ago off the books. So uh, it's actually not costing the, the contractor anything apart from for maintenance, fuel, servicing, etc. cetera. Uh, next question. What strategy can the contractor adopt if the contract does not have any provision for prolongation costs? Uh, you will find, and FIDIC is a good example of this, that uh, there's nowhere in FIDIC that says that you can claim for prolongation costs. Uh, it does, however, say that you can claim for an extension of time, and if the contractor incurs costs, you can claim uh, for, for those costs, and in some cases, plus profit. Now, uh, it, it is a fact that if an extension of time is warranted, uh, you, the contractor, will incur costs in keeping his site off uh, site establishment running and his contributing to head office overheads and, and and profit for a longer period. So that's a cost incurred, uh, but it, it doesn't say anywhere uh, prolongation costs. That's that, that's a terminology uh, that that is in use. But FIDIC doesn't actually say you can claim for prolongation costs. It doesn't define the cost to that level. And I don't know another form of contract that does actually use the word uh, prolongation costs. No, that's all right. Now, uh, Russell, uh, we've got, I can see the question here. This is one of the questions that I, I answered this morning. <laughs> so uh, you're obviously keen. Uh, I've given you a detailed reply here, Russell, but basically Russell is an engineer on a project. Uh, the contractor submitted a badly presented claim, a, a badly and inadequately expressed claim. Uh, Russell knows that the events happened. He knows that the contractor gives uh, a contract gives entitlement to uh, an extension of time and cost, I think. But the contractor has done such a bad job in his claim. Russell uh, has got to reject it, which is the correct thing to do. Uh, and it, it, the advice that is asking is, how do I reject it? Now, I wouldn't just reject it full stop. Uh, I would say that, yes, I, I agree that the events took place. Uh, yes, I agree that there is entitlement to uh, make a claim in the contract. But for these reasons, I cannot verify that the costs that you are claiming are correct. So... Uh, on the basis of the claim that's been submitted, I have to reject it. However, if you can give me the information that I need to verify the, the accuracy of the cost claim, I will relook at this item. Or you could just ask for further and better particulars for the claim to enable you to uh, correctly assess the matter. Uh, that's the way I would do it, because I mean, if, if you're saying, Russell, you know the event happened, you know there's entitlement, it's just the quantum of the claim that you're not happy with. So uh, I, I wouldn't reject it outright without giving the contractor the opportunity to have a second bite at the cherry and try to put a claim that is actually uh, sustainable uh, to you. And you have every right to ask for that as the engineer. Okay. And yes, Russell, if you uh, check your email, I sent you uh, a written reply earlier today. And I will just take that little segue to give a plug for the ICCP that he is a member and that is uh, a benefit of membership. If you have some sort of question, you can send it to me and I can get some information for you. All right, uh, next question. Uh, if the approved 
Extension of time is, let's say, 100 days, including concurrent delays from the employer and contractor, does it follow that the number of days for prolongation cost is also 100 days, or is it only the number of days attributable to the employer? Iris, you, you are totally correct. In, in fact, I, I couldn't put it in <laughs> uh, any better myself. If there's concurrency of 10 days, the contractor is only able to claim uh, for 90 days uh, out of that 100 uh, for his prolongation cost. So, yeah, well, very well summarized there, Irish. Yeah. Okay, there is a follow up bit to that. Um, in that related example, if there was a 20 day delay, but only 13 days are used for the prolongation cost. Ah, no. Uh, I think you're talking here, Iris, about the, the case study that we used in the in the presentation. That 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 is different. There was no concurrent delay there. Uh, what we're saying that the 20-day delay to the basement uh excavation, when we did the delay analysis, because there was seven days float in the program, uh it uh, only delayed the time for completion by uh, by 13 days. So that's different to what you were saying. There's no concurrent delay there. Concurrent delay is when an employer's delay and a contractor's delay, both of which affect the time for completion, occur at the same time. So I hope that clarifies it. I, I will uh, commit to any of these questions that are from members. I will uh, get some answers for you and... Uh, send them by email. And um, once again, I want to thank Andy for staying for an hour and a half for a one hour webinar. I would like to thank the 95 people who have stayed to the end. And I would like to again announce if you registered for our April 24th webinar on the Fittick White Book Due to the uh, Eid holidays being announced yesterday, we have moved that to May 3rd, but it will be at the same time of day. So 12 p.m. GMT or 1 p.m. British summertime. Andy, do you have any final words? Yeah, there's just one more question. Uh, will okay. we receive the certificate for attending? Only if you remember. So if you need a certificate, come and join us. <laughs> Yes, uh, as I said in my little beginning introductory explanation of the ICCP, uh, CPD certificates are a benefit of membership, even though we do open most of our webinars up to the general public. All right. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Jen, for, for being your usual uh, <laughs> pleasant and efficient host. Thank you. Right. And thanks, thanks to everybody for, uh, for logging in today. Yeah, 